Okay, welcome back to this uh, second session of artificial neural networks. In the previous session, we discussed, of course, we had a detailed discussion about the basics of artificial neural network. We went through what is artificial intelligence and how we are going to make the artificial intelligence to a human intelligence. We compared both of them and how we are going to bring out an artificial intelligence. What is going to be the hardware for that? What are the algorithms? How we are going to implement an artificial neural network? And how we are going to mimic the uh, artificial neural network from a brain's natural neural network? A few things, of course, in the last previous class we have discussed. Now we are going to continue with these biological neurons. So far, we have studied about the brain architecture and inside the brain what are the various functions and how or where the neurons actually reside and how the network of neurons is formed. Now we are going to analyze what is actually inside the neuron and what is the function of neuron, how it takes the input, how it computes some calculations and how it gives out the outputs. Right? So that is what actually we are going to see. The biological neurons, the structure of this biological neuron mainly comprises of a cell body which is actually called as a soma. And all the inputs are given through a axon of presynaptic neuron. So the outputs of the previous neuron will be entering into this particular neuron through this axons. Right? So these are all dendrites actually which bring the inputs to the cell body or soma. And the some computation of course takes place and once the computational output is going to be given out through the axon hillocks. And this hillock is actually the connection between this neuron or the cell body to this axon. That point is called axon hillock. And there will be a action potential, right? Basically, actually, the, all the decisions which are taken by the neuron is only based on the electrochemical process, some potential differences. And this potential difference will be propagated to the next neuron maybe through this axon. And this synaptic terminal is actually the connection between the one neuron to the other neuron. So this is the basic structure of a biological neuron. So we will just see the paths of this. First it contains a soma or cell body and it contains the cell's nucleus and other vital components called organelles which perform specialized task. Of course, where that non-linear system is available inside this nucleus. A set of dendrites which are going to bring the inputs from the previous neurons and it forms a tree-like structure that spreads out from the cell. The neuron receives its input electric signals along these things. Right? So already we have discussed, we have a tree-like structure is available. So all these things are actually given as the input and this output going to one or many neurons. And it is actually a single axon is available from every neurons. So this is the architecture of the neural network. Of course, we are going to continue here. It is a tubular extension from the cell soma that may repeatedly branch to form an axonal tree. tree. It carries an electrical signal called action potential. Right? Basically, there are two potentials available. When the neuron is not working, right? so they will be having a, will be having a resting potential. And whenever a decision is to be taken or whenever a yes or no decision has to be taken, there will be an action potential will be uh, stimulated from one neuron to other neuron. So that is actually called as the action potential away from the soma to another neuron for processing. And the dendrites and axon together sometimes are called as the processes of the cell. And axons and dendrites are the main communication links of a neuron. In addition to that, there are going to be glial cells, right? So it is almost 90%. So 9 tenths of the available cells in the brain are called actually glial cells. And there are three varieties are available. And the first thing is a star-shaped astroglia surround the neurons, right? And they isolate them from the smallest blood vessels. And the main function of this is going to have an interface with the capillary walls called the blood-brain barrier. And the main function is it is to absorb the nutrients 
from the blood and it transfers them to the neuron. So, where it gets the energy into that. And it provides a physical support and electrical isolation for neurons which minimizes interneuron crosstalk. Right? The second one is microglia or small cells that move continuously between the neurons and glia to clean up the debris. Right? And the third one is oligodendroglia send out membranous process that wrap themselves tightly around the axons forming a dense layer of spiraling membranes called a melian sheath. Right. So, these glial cells will form the 90 percent of the cells and the remaining things are going to be neurons and the main function of this glial cells is they cover it, they absorb the nutrients and they will be used to cleaning the debris. So, these are all the three functions of this glial cells. And what is actually a cell membrane? Again, uh, whatever we use in our RO, right, a reverse osmosis process. So, there is going to be a membrane and there will be ions will be exchanged. So, a similar thing again happens here again. So, the cell membrane encloses all the neurons in a two layered structure about 90 angstrom unit thick, right, it is 10 power minus 10 meters, right, and a dimension that can only view, uh, only viewed using an electron microscope. The crystal, sorry, the cytosol within the cell is effectively isolated from the cellular fluid by the phospholipid bilayer membrane which consists of phospholipid molecules and each and every molecule will be containing hydrophilic and hydrophobic, right, two types of water loving and water avoiding cells will be available and these molecules self organizes into a stable surface. This is actually the organization of the cell membrane will be con consisting of this phospholipids. So, there is actually a protons and they will be organized in a proper way. So, they can self organize themselves. The next one is going to be the resting potential. So, already we discussed. So, the neurons and will be consisting of so many ions and this ion concentration inside the neurons or inside the nucleus and outside the neuron will be differing. So, there will be a potential difference will be existing based on the ion concentration difference. Now, we will be just seeing what is actually the resting potential. The resting potential is actually when no work is taking place inside the neuron, we will be having a constant potential that may be called as a resting potential. And this resting potential arises due to a difference in the ion concentration inside and outside the cell. Right. So, when there is a cell is available, so what is the concentration of the ions inside and outside? So, based on the difference between these two things, we will be having a small resting potential. And absorbed through a recordings from an electrode placed inside the cell is about 65 minus 65 millivolts with respect to the external medium. So, this is actually the normal resting potential that is existing. I think this diagram shows yeah, actually we are measuring using an electrode, micro electrode. And with respect to the common ground, a ground, a voltmeter shows around something around minus 65 millivolts, which is actually the resting potential. So, here actually we can just see the concentration of different ions within and outside the neuron membrane. So, what are all the ions available? This is this gives an idea. The first one is actually the sodium ions that is actually Na plus. Second one is the potassium ions K plus. The third one is chloride ion that is Cl minus. So, these positive and negative ions will be available in and out of the neurons. And concentration inside that is actually mentioned in the millimolar, right. So, 10 power minus 3 molar per liter, right. So, here actually it is going to be around 15 and concentration outside the neuron is going to be around 150. This is for the sodium case. For the potassium case, here the concentration inside is going to be around 100 and the concentration outside is going to be 5. For chloride, the concentration inside will be 13, the concentration outside is going to be 150. So, this potential difference, the concentration inside the uh, neuron and outside the neuron is actually generating the potential difference. Now, these ions diffuse into and out of the cell because of the concentration gradient. So, since there is going to be a difference in the concentration, these uh, ions will seep out or seep in into the nuclear, I mean the into the neurons. 
So, this is actually the process. So, whenever there is some sort of disturbance, right, how I can retrieve my equilibrium potential. So, this is actually the case and the excess within the cell and it diffuses out. So, actually I take the K plus, right, it is actually a positive thing and this ion is actually excess within the cell and it tries to diffuse out. So, what happens? Leaves behind the unbalanced negative charges within the cell. So, when this positive is coming out, so there will be a negative charges within the cells will be available. So, the makes the interior increasingly negative, exterior increasingly positive. So, since the positive ions are coming out, inside the cell you will be having more negative and outside the cell you will be having more positive. So, sets up an electric field which opposes the movement of the ions. So, naturally an electric field that opposes the movement of this ion is formed and eventually leads to an equilibrium point. At some point of time, there will be an equilibrium will be formed so that the ions will not be moving out. So, no net movement across the membrane happens and this electrical force due to the charge imbalance balances the diffusive force. So, that there will be resting, I mean there will be getting into the equilibrium potential. Here actually the Nernst equation, the Nernst equation is actually a general equation which relates these parameters. One is actually the R is the ideal gas constant, T is mentioned as the temperature in Kelvin, Z is the charge inside the ion X, F is the Faraday's constant and X of 0 and X of i are the concentrations of X outside and inside the cell respectively. So, some particular value X. So, what is the concentration inside? and what is the concentration outside and the, all the other these things are actually constants. So, it will give out what is going to be the potential difference that will be available. So, this Nernst equation is actually uh, give us an idea about this particular relation. So, when we are going to apply this Nernst equation so that we can calculate what is going to be the potential difference that exists between the inside and outside of a cell. So, here you can see here given the charge of an ion and its concentration inside and outside the cell, the Nernst equation predicts the potential difference across the cell. So, this potential difference is actually the decision making power, right. So, one potential difference will be either propagated to other neurons or it can, can get suppressed. We are going to see that. And assuming the ion in questions is in a state of equilibrium where it neither flows or nor are outside the cell, whether it is going to be flowing to the outside or it is going to be inside the thing we are going to see. So, this equilibrium points already we discussed for uh, assuming the temperature of the body is around 37 degrees and for ion with Z equal to positive, the RT by ZF value comes around 26.72 millivolts. Similarly, for an ion with Z equal to minus 1, the RT by ZF actually what is Z? Here actually we have you can see the Z is the charge, right? So, it may have a positive charge or it may have a negative charge. So, based on the positive charge or negative charge, the value of this can be 26.72 or minus 26.72 which is RT divided by ZF. And we have already discussed what is going to be the concentration of these ions, right? Here actually we discussed the concentration of these ions. Here it is 15, outside is it is 150. So, we are going to substitute these values for x here for x0 and the xi. So, in that case the equilibrium membrane potentials for these three ions can be calculated using this simple expression. So, the first one is the chloride. For this chloride case it is minus 26.72 into this concentration 150 divided by 13, right? So, ln of 150 divided by 13 which comes around minus 65.34 millivolts, right? So, using this particular Nernst expression, it is a natural logarithm of course, using this Nernst expression we can find out what is going to be the potential difference. So, for this chloride the potential difference is minus 65.34 millivolts. For the sodium here actually the output and input is going to be 150. 15. So, 26.72 into natural logarithm of 150 divided by 15 which will be calculated as 61.52 and for the third case it is potassium. 
The potential difference because of this potassium is 26.72 because it is positive into natural logarithm of 5 divided by 100 which will be calculated as minus 80.04 millivolts. So, this is actually the normal potential difference that exists inside an outside cell because of this change in the ions. Now, maintaining the resting potential, right? So, how a resting potential is maintained? Here we will see the microscopic uh, sodium potassium pumps. So, there are going to be small pumps, right? Something like uh, now actually we are calculating MIMS and all those things which can uh, pump a very small amount of any liquid. But our brain has these natural pumps, right? So, and these pumps are made up of this uh, sodium potassium pumps and these are actually very small pumps which can push out or pull in some sodium ions, right. So, here you can just go through this uh, microscopic sodium potassium pumps actively pump sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. So, it brings in the potassium and it can pump out the sodium in order to maintain a high sodium ion concentration outside the cell and high potassium concentration within the cell. And this pump consists of a single protein molecule or a complex of protein subunits with a molecular weight of 2,75,000 D. D. D is actually the, it is actually the Dalton, it is the unit for measuring the molecular weight, right. So, 275,000 Dalton is actually the molecular weight of this proteins. And each unit of the pump exchanges some 200 sodium ions, some 200 sodium ions for 130 potassium ions for every second. So, here already we discussed the sodium out of the cell should be, the sodium should be pumped out and the potassium should be pumped in. So, here actually what happens 200 sodium ions will be going out and 130 potassium ions will be brought inside. And about a million such pumps at a density of 100 to 200 per square micron of membrane surfaces available in the brain we can say. In every uh, small piece per square micron size and at rest about 40 percent of the cells metabolic energy expenditure is for pumping ions in and out. So, 40 percent of the energy is actually useful for pumping this ions inside and outside the cells. Now, whenever there is actually a potential difference right. So, there will be a graded potential. Graded potential in the sense the potential will not be remain constant throughout the path, right. So, there will be variation in terms of space and in terms of time. So, here actually what happens whenever your potential difference is generated, it will not be constant, right. So, there will be a graded potential will be available with respect to space and time. We will see that now the external signals impinging on the neuron, right. So, some inputs, right, some, some, some inputs is given to the neuron. And uh, actually there is going to be some external signals are generated and then again it is going to be a electrochemical signals. And these signals impinging on the neurons at these synapses create disturbances in the cell potential. So, normally there is a resting potential is available. Whenever there is an input is given actually there is a small change in this cell potential. And this potential is actually a graded potential. It will not be a constant so it will be graded. Right. And if an impinging signal decreases the internal potential below the resting potential, then the neuron is hyperpolarized. So, already there is a resting potential. Because of this input, suppose if the internal potential decreases to some level, then that is actually called as hyperpolarized. On the other hand, if the external disturbance increases the potential above the resting potential, then the neuron is said to be hypopolarized or depolarized. So, based on the input, the potential can be hyperpolarized or it can be depolarized or hypopolarized. So, what is actually the space constant? I think uh, this graph is uh, visible, I hope. Now, what is actually the space constant? Already I told you it is going, going to be a graded potential. So, the potential will not be same throughout, but there will be a grading, right? So, it will be gradually increasing or decreasing, something like that. So, the graded potential spread in space, right? and decay exponentially with the distance, right. So, it is exponential means and this is actually right the curve, right, exponential curve is there. So, with respect to the space, the potential actually decreases. So, this looks similar to your first order system. I think you might have studied uh, this first order system in your control systems, right. So, 1 minus e power minus t, 
right when uh, the value is 1 1 power e power minus 1 is going to be the 63.2 percentage i think the time constant and all those things the so same thing is actually applicable here again so in this case of decreasing this the distance over which the potential decays to 36.8 right so it is actually decreasing normally we will be calculating 63.2 percentage of the final value that's the first order time constant so here actually for this case 36.8 percentage of this of the initial value is called as the space constant. So, similar to the time constant here actually we have the space constant. Here actually the x axis we are going to have the space and the y axis actually we have the potential difference. And then the space constant is different on every part of course it is not going to be the same it will be different and what are the factors that affect the space content? The one is the shape of the membrane right. So, what is going to be the shape of the membranes? the number of the ion channels that is available, the nature of the membrane potentials or uh, proteins and since the amount of fluid inside the membrane of the dendrite is responsible for conduction of electricity, the space constant also depends on the diameter of the dendrite. So, these are all some of the factors that affect how this space constant is available inside this right. The next one is actually the time constant of course, uh, the time constant in the sense with respect to time suppose there is some external stimulus is given and there is an increase or decrease in the potential again the resting potential whether we can increase the potential or uh, coming uh, down the potential. So, how with respect to time the potential difference is there. So, that uh, that is actually explained in the time constant. So, when an external stimulus disturb the ionic balance of the ions in a resting membrane it takes a finite time right it will take some time for the diffusion and the pumping of ions to restore the resting potential. So, so there is some disturbance. Now, it has to come back to its normal resting potential by pumping in or out the suitable ions. So, but that will take a definite time. So, this graded potential are thus sustained for some time before they decay back to the equilibrium values. So, there will be it will be taking some definite time and the time constant quantifies the rate at which the decay to the resting value takes place. And for a typical neuron, the time constant is about 4 to 10 milliamps. This is actually the point. So, it is going to take around 4 to 20, 10 milliamps for any disturbance to cease out. Thus, when the stimulus is applied to a dead right, the membrane potential is restored to the rest value in a small fraction of a second. So, within 4 to 10 milliamps, all these fluctuations in the voltages, that potential difference will be ceases out, will be sorted out. And then the graded potentials are electrical potentials and are conducted through the neuron at the speed of the light, right. So, this graded potentials will be conducted through the path from one neuron to some other neuron. Already we told each and every neuron will be having dendrites and every neuron will be having at the output axons. So, the potential some calculation will be taking place in the nucleus. And this process, again this is going to be a parallel process already I told you. So, there are going to be millions of neurons and every neuron will be doing some part of work and every input will be given to almost all the neurons right according to the network. Uh, whichever the neurons connected that will be taking the inputs and that will be giving some calculation on and some, some outputs. Yes, and the cell soma temporarily integrates impinging signals. Right. So, each and every case. So, the I have actually this is a assume there is a cell soma that is actually the nucleus and this nucleus is connected to so many uh, previous neurons and every neuron is giving some outputs and in that case temporally means with respect to time. With respect to time the cell soma integrates all the incoming signals right. So, here actually we are going to see the synapses. So, the synapses are the points of contact where the neuron constantly receives inputs from the other neurons right along their dendrites. So, dendrite is actually the input part which gives the input to the neurons. Now, this synapsis is actually the point of contact where the output of one axon is connected to the dendrite of other neuron right. So, this synapsis takes these electrochemical changes again there is already we are we are of course we are going to see that there will be a chemical to potential change electrical change and electrical to chemical change both the things are actually takes uh, takes place here something like a transduction process right. So, there will be a energy change will happen 
chemical energy to electrical energy, then electrical energy to chemical energy. Then the post synaptic potentials, once this stimulation is done, we have PSPs that is called post synaptic potentials. And these inputs which are in the form of small electrical disturbances. So again, it is going to be a small electrical pulses, electrical voltages. Now, hundreds or thousands of tiny PSPs occur asynchronously in space under time. So you just think of, right, so there is a neuron and this neuron is, get, is connected to something around 1000 neurons. Just I am giving some sample numbers, 1000 neurons output is connected to this particular single neuron. And all these 1000 neurons may give out different voltage potentials right at the different spaces and at different times. So you will be getting so many inputs at different uh, amplitudes and different time space right. So all these values are coming into the neuron right. So hundreds and thousands of tiny PSPs this post synaptic potential differences will be entering into the neuron along, the, along its dendrites. Now each PSP is an increasing or decreasing voltage pulse. Now again, we can't say that everything is going to be only positive. Either it can increasing or it can be a decreasing one, right? So the voltage may be uh, may increase or it can decrease. So different PSP values will be coming in, and again they are actually asynchronous. So they are not synchronous and all those things. So it may come at any time, and again the space is different. One in some cases it will be fired by a very near neuron. In some cases, this neuron input may be from a distance neuron. So, it will be different in space, it will be different in time. But the point is, there are going to be a so many impinging signals based on so many inputs, so many neuron outputs are entering into the cell soma and this cell soma temporarily integrates. So, these small disturbances are superimposed upon each other. So, when I am going to have some 1000 inputs and this 1000 inputs are superimposed to each other. So, there is some sort of computation will be done inside each and every cell soma. So, therefore, the soma potential reflects a temporal integration of these potentials. And the soma potential varies continuously in time because already we told there is going to be a space variation, there is going to be a time variation. So, there is go when we are going to integrate these signals, the potential, <coughs> the potential difference will be continuously varying. The soma potential varies continuously in time, sometimes increasing or sometimes it is going to be decreasing back towards the resting potential, right. So, already there is a resting potential. Now, this value may increase or this value may decrease below the resting potential. Again, it is actually the accumulation of all the previous inputs. And this is actually the action potential, all right. I think uh, this uh, uh, this uh, diagram is not visible. I can just uh, say here you can see some sort of pulses like this, right. Some sort of pulses will be like this, something like this will be that. So these are all actually the action potential. potential. So what is, it, what is it? At the point where the axon of the neuron meets the cell body, the axon expands into a structure called the axon hillock. So it is actually the point the output of the neuron goes out, right. And here the ion channels exist in considerably high density and are highly sensitive to small perturbances, small disturbances in the integrated soma potential. So already we told the soma takes so many inputs. And the ion channels constantly monitor the soma potential in such a way that when the cell potential exceeds a threshold value of about 40 minus 40 millivolts, this is actually the point. Right. So, there is going to be a potential difference already we discussed. So, when the threshold value of minus 40 millivolts, right, when the cell potential exceeds this threshold value, then the neuron fires. So, what does it mean? It is going to be an action potential. So, there will be around minus 40 volts, minus 40 millivolts. So, it gives a pulse to the output, to the output axon, right. So, we just will go through this. Ion channels constantly monitor the soma potential of course and in such a way that when the cell potential exceeds a value of around minus 40 millivolts, the neuron fires an action potential and this action potential is transmitted down its axon towards a synaptic terminal. 
So this output will be connected to other neurons. So this output will be given as the input to the other neurons. And the refractory periods, right? Actually, this is how actually we are going to take some decisions, whether I have to go to my native or not, right? So you will be getting so many things to think of. And finally, I will take a decision. I have to go to my native today or I am not going to take my native today. So how the decisions are taken based on the resting potential and based on this action potential, right, fine. So refractory periods, right, and no matter how strong the applied external stimulus, right, so we are getting some inputs, some external stimulations are done and an action potential cannot be regenerated during the action potential itself. Already there is one action potential is there, immediately I can't have another potential difference. Right, so there will be some period will be there, right, and this period of inexcitability, right, last for something around 1 to 2 milliseconds. It will take at least 1 to 2 milliseconds between two successive action potential hikes and is called the absolute refractory period, right. So that is actually for refreshing itself before generating the next pulse. And during the undershoot, when the potassium channels are closing, it is more difficult than usual to excite the axon since the membrane potential is still hyperpolarized. This period is called relative refractory period because the axon is excitable but requires a larger stimulus than normal. So if the potassium channels are actually closing right, and the potential difference is decreasing, so it may take more time to build up that required strength so that it can fire the next output. So there is going to be a definite delay will be there. So something around 1 to 2 millisecond we have said and there will be a small period, a relative refractory period which will be larger when the potential differences because of the potential, I mean the, because of the potassium channels are closing. And the absolute and relative refractory periods naturally impose a biological limit on the maximum frequency of firing of action potential of course I have said and no neuron can respond at rates much over 1000 spikes per second. So this we can take it as a the maximum operating frequency of the brain something around 1000 hertz, right because there is going to be a delay between two successive spikes, right. So around 100 hertz, uh, sorry 1000 hertz and even this is possible only for a fraction of second with the very strong stimuli. So even if I want to uh, give spikes at around this 1000 spikes per second, even then we need a very strong stimuli in order to give the immediate pulse. And this is what actually the output, so this is actually the action hillock, right. So here I will be having the nucleus of this uh, neuron and this point is actually connecting and this potential difference, right. So we actually call it as the action potential. And this will be passing through this, through the node of Ranvir and there is going to be an axon terminal, right. So this is actually the action potential and this potential will be propagated through this node of Ranvir and to axon terminals, right. Now the sequence of events in the propagation, how my output of one neuron is connected to the other one. As the action potential waveform rises towards its peak at the axon hillock, the potential along considerable length of axonal membrane adjacent to the axon hillock is also pushed above the threshold. So there will be a potential increase will happen. And the membrane is exposed at the nodes of Ranvir where sodium channels open due to the adjacent disturbances and initiates the entire sequence of events that generate an action potential. And the action potential jumps from node to node, from one node to some other node and this is actually called as the saltatory conduction and continuously renewed in full strength as it passes physically down the axon. And this design obviates the need for biological amplifiers because whenever I am going to transmit right, a pulse, normally the strength of the pulse will uh, actually it will get attenuated right, or it will decrease. So the one output may not be able to fire the other, but each and every case here there will be some sort of biological amplifiers irrespective of the length of the axon will be available so that these pulses will be transmitted through. And this is actually the chemical synapses that happens between one output and the other input. Here actually the transmission process across the synapse 
requires a two step transduction process right already we discussed transduction in the sense a chemical to electrical conversion and the electrical to back to chemical conduction so here from the electrical action potential to the chemical transmitter substance which is released into the synaptic cleft so this is this area is going to be a very small area which is actually called as the synaptic cleft and here actually i am going to have this action potential and this is the axon terminal this is the pre synaptic neuron axon right so this is actually the neurotransmitter vessels so when the potential is coming here so these will be have uh, this potential will be given as the chemical potential and this will be getting into the other dendrite so this will take the data to the other neuron so this is called post synaptic neuron dendrite and this is going to be a neurotransmitter receptor sites so like this there will be so many inputs will be there and so many outputs will be there so the data or the pulse will be transmitted from the output of one neuron to the input of the other neuron through this method yes. so as we discussed the output of the one neuron will be given as the input to the other neuron so these neurons transduce the signals right already we told there will be a electrical to chemical and from chemical back to electrical will happen here and each synapse is associated with what we call the synaptic efficacy right the synaptic efficacy is the efficiency of which a signal is transmitted from the pre synaptic to post synaptic right so this is actually the electron uh, this is actually the cell cell soma and there will be so many inputs will be coming here so these are all actually dendrites we can just assume there is some input is available here and that is associated with some weight and this is the input and this is actually the dendrite that takes the input here and here you can see there will be some sort of bias some sort of bias will also be added here and you will be getting so many inputs from all the dendrites that is coming in and some computation will be taken place inside this and there will be one axon and the output of this will be given to the other axons right so this is how actually a complete neural network neuron works now this diagram is actually giving a equivalent circuit what we can uh, call it as a artificial neuron so here we can see there are uh, one two three sample inputs are actually taken and each and every input we can call it as say for example x1 x2 and x3 may be there and then here each and every input will be given through some weights right each and everything will be given through some weights w1 w2 or w3 and all these inputs are given to this neuron and some computation is actually taking place and then followed by some function will, will also be there which is actually going to give some non linear non linearity and that is going to give a out output and this is actually called as the bias all right so this is what actually happens when the neuron computation is performed here we will see that now here the activations and the weights so here the jth artificial neuron right so the jth artificial neuron that receives the input signals from si right so this is actually the si input and from possibly n different sources so there is going to be one this is going to be n so it is taking inputs from n different sources it is getting the output and one such instance is actually si and an internal activation xj is available so this is actually xj and which is actually the linear weighted aggregation of the impinging signals modified by an internal threshold theta j so here actually uh, here the xj is calculated as a function of all these inputs and also some of the some value called as bias right and uh, actually we call it as a bias as theta j and it's the aggregation of all the weighted inputs from s1 to sn so the connection weights wij each and every input is connected to this by using a small weight factor so the weight factor is actually a multiplication factor and this connection weights wij model the synaptic efficacies of various interneuron synapses so, so it can be either increase or decrease right and what is actually the equation for xj the simple equation so this is actually the corresponding weight this is the input these two values are multiplied and for each and every value of i the transform 1 to n because each and every will be having so many inputs there are going to be n inputs will be there 
For example, this particular input S i, i is actually the input, j is the output, so I mean uh, the in, uh, input side this neuron. So we call this particular weight as w suffix i comma i j, right. So from the ith source to the jth, uh, jth artificial neuron. So likewise, we will be having w i j into the corresponding source s i. So and i runs from 1 to n. So all these values will be accumulated and also the bias value is going to get added here. So this is the what is the activation and the weightage of each and every neuron function. And what is going to be the signal function? This is, this is actually the second part, the signal function. The activation of the neuron is subsequently transformed through a signal function. This is actually the signal function, the second part. That generates the output signal Sj, which is equal to some function of this Sj. This is actually the output signal function. A signal function may typically be a binary threshold, Gaussian function, probabilistic function, linear threshold or sigmoidal. So already actually we discussed, all right, for each and every case, a normal computer can take almost all the linear operations, where the operation can be represented as a linear or some sort of equation, right. So there is some relation between the output and the input. When we are going to have a non-linearity in the input, right, how to incorporate the non-linearity in the function of a neuron. That is why actually we have, they have divided it into two parts. The first part is the accumulation of all the inputs, whatever it is possible. So this we can consider as a linear because as per the previous uh, expression, it is represented by some equation, right. So this is actually the linear part and then of course including this, right. So the value will be added together. So we can represent it as an input, no issues. But once this xj, when it is given out to this sj, in that case there will be some function will be available. That function is actually a non-linear function, right. So what is actually non-linear? Already we discussed linear means suppose if my input, this is my input, if this is my output. If the input increases, then the output is also increasing something like this. Right. So this is actually with respect to input, with respect to time. So the input increases. So again, this is going to be my output with respect to time. So the output also increases. Right. The, of course, the ratio can vary. But if the input and output are not having any relations, right, or with respect to time, I have made it, or with respect to input and output also, we can make it, of course. Right. So in this case, if it is linear, it will be a straight line, something like this, right. Suppose if it is non-linear, you will be getting a waveform like this or you may get a waveform like this. So all these things are actually the output versus input graph. It is, these are all going to be non-linear. Sometimes it will be increasing fast, sometimes it is increasing slow and the slope of this particular curve will not be constant like the linear curve. So this type of non-linearity has to be introduced so that the neural network can also take care of the non-linear functions. Now, what are all these non-linear curves that can be incorporated? For that actually, some, so many types are used. A few things are binary threshold, Gaussian, linear threshold, probabilistic and the sigmoidal. Of course, we are going to see them one by one. The basic thing, of course, the acti uh, activations measure similarities. That again is there. The activation xj is simply the inner product of the impinging signal vector, right? Yes, which is going to be S0 to Sn transpose with the neuronal weight vector wj. Already we discussed, right? So each and everything is going to be some value, some input multiplied by the corresponding weight vectors. So i runs from 0 to n, what is the corresponding weight and what is the input? This is going to be my xj, which is actually the uh, linear factor. And when this linear factor is connected to a non-linear function, you will be getting output the, as the output. Now, since based on this input, based on the inputs, the factor, the output is also changes, we can consider this as an adaptive filter. 
right so it will try to learn the new things right that is actually called as an adaptive filter now what are all actually the binary function what are all the asynchronous functions now already we discussed a linear function with respect to output and input is something like this when the output when the input increases the output also increases right in a proportional way but here actually what happens suppose in the case of a binary threshold signal function we will be having a net positive activations translate to a positive one signal so there will be only two values that's why actually it's called as a binary threshold when the value goes beyond certain limit the output is going to be one and when the value is below certain limit the output is going to be zero so there is no relation between input and output there is no proportional relation right that is not available here and this of course can be biased right either you can prepone or postpone this zero by adding a small constant values here actually here the value is minus three around right so using this bias i have simply adjusted or moved this zero point to this minus three value so this is actually the binary threshold signal function so this is actually a non linear function where at some point my value will be zero at some point my value is going to be one there is no proper relation between these two things and so the net negative activations translate to a zero signal value the threshold logic neuron is a two state machine either it is going to be zero state or it is going to be one state that is actually the value of my sj and this s is actually the non linear function xj is actually the input to that particular non linear function the next one is in between this right say for example we have calculated something like this right so this is some value it's up to 0 and sometime it increases and stays at 1 why i have to get this value right in between whether we can have the another factor in between so here we are having this value that is actually called as threshold logic neuron that is called tln and we are going to call it as in discrete time right so actually already we discussed there are three types of signals there will be a continuous signal analog signal there will be a digital signal in between there will be a pulsed signal which is actually called as the time signal in discrete time intervals so here actually what happens the updated signal value of k plus 1th sample right it's actually the value at particular sample at a time instant k plus 1 is generated from the neuron activation xi k plus 1 sampled at the time instant k plus 1 so k plus 1 is actually the sampling instant or we can call it as a sample number the response of the threshold logic neuron as a two state machine can be extended to a bipolar case where the signals are minus 1 to plus 1 the resulting signal function is then none other than the signum function sin x commonly encountered in communication theory so instead of 0 and 1 we can make it as minus 1 comma 1 or he can make it as 0 1 in between some value also we can have it so based on some threshold value these values will be taken care so here here you can see the interpretation of this threshold so here the xj equal to the summation of i runs from 0 to n wij si and of course there will be a bias will be added together so it takes two part one part is actually qj the other part is theta j we can call it as and for zero bias any value up to zero the value is going to be zero then it moves to one and then thereafter it stays in the one condition and for bias equal to 3 it is left shifted by a minus 3 value so it is going to be zero and one so from the point of view of the net creation xj the signal is plus 1 if xi equal to xj equal to qj plus this theta j when this value is greater than 0 here right this value is greater than 0 or when the qj is less than or we can from this value, from this value qj is greater than or equal to minus theta j right and if the value will be is going to be 0 if the qj is less than this theta j so this theta j is actually the bias qj is the input so when the input is greater than the bias 
and when the input is less than the bias, the values are going to be plus 1 and 0 respectively. So, this is actually the bias. The neuron thus compares the net external input. So, it gets the input from the QJ. QJ is actually the WIJ plus SI and this is actually the bias. So, this is this value is going to be 0 and when the this value is higher than this value, right, when this QJ is greater than theta j, my output is 1. So, the neuron thus compares these two values, the net external input QJ. If QJ is greater than the negative threshold, then it fires plus 1, otherwise it fires a 0. The next one is the linear threshold function. So, why it should be something like this? Why it should be something like this? Why it can't be like this? Right? Or why some sort of other non-linearity can be incorporated? So, this is what actually happens here. So, now actually what we are doing is the 0 and 1 remains the same, but in between for some values between 0 and 2, we are going to define some also alpha value, some slope value. So, here actually what happens when the a j which is actually we can call it as alpha j, right? So, alpha j is equal to 1 by x m is the slope parameter of the function. So, this is actually the slope. Right, so that that straight line will be uh, having a slope, and the alpha j is equal to 0.5 in that case. So figure plotted for x m equal to 2, and the alpha j is equal to 0.5, and s j x j equal to max of this value. Note that in this course we assume the neurons within a network are homogeneous. Right, so here actually what we have done is instead of a vertical line we are going to make a slope so that the output transition will happen through this particular path. And of course, this happens at 0 and I can make it through a bias either I can move it towards right or I can move it towards left. So, here actually I am making a small output change here actually my theta j is equal to minus 1. So, that will be delayed by 1 and then the same slope will be there. So, this is called the linear threshold function. Here again it is linear threshold function, but it is shifted by 1. 